Good morning, my name is Dr. George Vargas, curator and director of programs at Mexicarte Museum in Austin, Texas. Today we tour the 37th annual Day of the Dead exhibition. But before we begin, let me give you a little bit of background on Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos. We celebrate it November 1st and November 2nd. November 1st is All Saints Day when we pray to the various saints and martyrs. It's also Dia de los Angelitos, the day of the little angels dedicated to the dead children who have passed away. Also, November 2nd is All Souls Day in which we pray to all the other saints and all the other souls, especially those souls that are stuck in purgatory. We pray for their release. Day of the Dead, Dios Muertos is a synthesis of so-called pagan, that is pre-Columbian celebration and Catholic rituals. Uh, right before the celebration, uh, people in Mexico and the United States uh, clean their houses, clean the cemeteries, and, and uh, begin to uh, construct their altars or ofrendas. And we'll look at those later uh, during the tour. Now, let's look at these marvelous prints from the Juan Antonio Sandoval Jr. collection. This year, this year we were fortunate to have do been donated this collection uh, that includes over 1200 objects. Let's look at one of the first prints. All these prints feature uh, issues of life and death. This print is by Oscar de las Flores and it's called The Abduction of Jose Guadalupe Posada. Posada was a very important, famous printmaker in Mexico, and he was known for using calaveras or skeletons to spoof or to criticize Mexican society, especially politicians. And here we see the, the demons from hell coming from below the ground, attacking him and about to carry him away. In the background, you also see a number of people who've also been carried away. And his assistant sees this and he's powerless to stop the demons from abducting Posada as well as other people. Now let's continue. Another one of my favorite pieces by Felipe Ehrenberg. Felipe Ehrenberg was a very popular Mexican artist. He called himself a nihilist. And here, this is Chipetotec and El Conquistador. Chipetotec and the Conquistador. On the left, you see the God of life and death and regeneration, Chipetotec, called the Lord of the Flayed Skin. And you see the remnants of a human skin that he wears. Chipetotec would wear this human skin that was offered up in human sacrifice, peeled off the victim, and then he would wear it until it would literally fall off his body, much like a snake shedding its skin. And this symbolizes regeneration. As a god of life and death, we see him fighting the conquistador, that is the Spanish warrior, part of uh, Hernan Cortes's army who came in and eventually conquered Mexico and developed Nueva España. But he's powerless to draw his sword as Chipe Totec delivers a death blow to the conquistador. Now let's continue our tour of these marvelous prints from the Juan Sandoval collection. This is by Ramiro Rodriguez, La Luna Mariposa the butterfly moon, if you will. And here we have a universal theme of mother and child, but they're dead. We don't know exactly how they died, but we know that they're dead because of the calavera, the death skull. We see the moon behind and we saw, we also see a number of butterflies that are fluttering about. The Aztec believe, according to their religion, that a dying person's last breath would be transformed into a butterfly, as we see here. On another level of interpretation, this is a migration of these two people who 
probably died as they attempted to cross over the border into America to achieve the American dream. It's also the migration of the monarch butterfly as the monarch butterfly travels back and forth between Canada, through the United States, Mexico, time and time again. And you see the butterfly landing on the milkweed. Very, very unique plant that the butterfly is attracted to. And it draws the food, the nutrients from this plant. It's also a poison that prevents uh, predators from eating the mariposa, the butterfly. Let's continue, please. Jesus Adorado, this print is called Nadie es Eterno. No one is eternal. And we all know that we will inevitably die. Plants die, animals die, and people die. And this is something that's very unique about the Mexican, Mexican American culture is this acceptance of death rather than fear it. We are in awe of it and we accept it and we celebrate it during Day of the Dead. Here the musician, the accordion player is playing his accordion. And again, we don't know how he died. He may have died playing the accordion, but nonetheless, he comes forth from the afterlife. We see a frame that he's passing through, a gate perhaps in which he leaves the afterlife and he comes to this reality to play music on our behalf. These are speech scrolls right here and right there. And those are taken from the Aztec uh, manuscripts that indicate um, speech, or in this case, song or musical notes emanating from the accordion. Let's continue over this side. This print by a very famous Mexican American or Chicano artist. He was a very uh, important sculptor as well as a printmaker. In this print, Baile con la Talaca, meaning dance with the skeleton. Sometimes we call the skeleton calavera or calaca. Jimenez uses his term talaca to represent that same idea. Here on the dance floor, we see a middle-aged man who wears work clothes, as we can see by his jeans and t-shirt and so forth. And he's dancing with a woman. And at a particular moment, she touches his head and he dies. And we see that she tra is transformed from a human, a woman into La Muerte. And we believe perhaps this is influenced by the Aztec lady of death. And this is a very important message again, underscoring the acceptance, the celebration of death. And many of us would rather die this way on the dance floor in pleasure rather than some awful painful death. And let's look at one more print, please. We turn over here to Dr. Eric Avery. Dr. Eric Avery is a retired psychiatrist who lives in Texas, in San Ignacio, Texas, uh, south of Laredo. And right now he's spending a lot of his time, energy, and devoting his art, his creativity to the Laredo Stop the Wall, Stop the Border Wall project. This particular print is inspired by Papel Picado, and we'll look at Papel Picado in a few minutes when we turn to the altars, the ofrendas in the next uh, room of the exhibition. And we see a number of uh, countries, including Mexico, that is Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. And these, all these calaveras or skeletons or talacas, calacas are being taken into hell they're being dragged into hell by El Diablo. El Diablo is an agent of the United States because we have got a long history of exploitation of these particular countries. These skeletons also represent the hundreds of thousands of 
of uh, people who have died, uh, either have been assassinated or have uh, been murdered uh, through, uh, through torture. And so they are also being drawn into hell. Next, let's now tour the ofrendas, the altars. And for this part of the tour, we'll introduce Nikki. Thank you Thank very you much. So, here you go. My name is Nikki Diaz. I'm an education associate here at Mexicarte. I hope everyone can hear me just fine, I think. Um, this section of our um, museum is the community altar section. And we'll start, before we get to the altars, we'll start with the um, some photography here. Mexicarta has been celebrating um, Dia de los Muertos since 1984. Um, what we do is we reach out to the community members around Austin, Texas and have them build altars or ofrendas to commemorate various loved ones or community figures or just anyone who's passed away. Um, before we get to the community altars, we're gonna start with these photos by Mary J. Andrade. These are from our collection. These are um, really good examples of traditional um, altars that Mary J. Andrade photographed in uh, various states of Mexico. These, this particular altar is uh, an altar honoring um, Don Vasco de Quiroga from uh, Morelia, Michoacan. And it's a really traditional altar. You see all the marigold flowers, which are the official Dia de los Muertos flowers. You see um, Pan de Muerto and various offerings, sugar skulls, um, candles. It's just, it's a very traditional altar. And uh, the state of Michoacan is believed to be where the first celebration of Dia de los uh, Muertos took place by some anthropologists. Oh, here's a photograph. Um, another one, these are all by Mary J. Andrade. These are two gentlemen carrying the arch after the vigil of the little angels. And this is on the island of Pacanda, which is in Pazcuaro, Mexico. And you can see that they have all the offerings on this um, arch food. Um, I believe I believe those are sugar skulls and sugar art, um, which is called alfenique, traditional sugar art. And then we have all the cempasuchil or marigold flowers. This is an example of, uh, this is, a, we got a question if this is a drawing. These are photographs that Mary J. Andrade took in um, Mexico. And this is um, in Michoacan. It's uh, family members visiting the grave sites. And like Dr. Vargas said, um, right before Dia los Muertos family members will go to the cemeteries and start preparing um, the graves, cleaning them off, um, placing flowers, placing candles. And then um, Dia los Muertos starts on October 31st at midnight. So they will actually be at the cemetery at night. So they're, they just prep everything for that because that's when they believe that um, the spirits start coming back from the land of the dead. And there's all the family members there. This is a good photo of um, a vigil at nighttime. Like I was saying, this is in Pazcuaro also, Pazcuaro, Mexico. Here's someone at a, a grave at nighttime. And I think this is a beautiful photo. And if you ever have a chance to go to a real Dia de los Muertos um, vigil at a cemetery, it's beautiful. It's like nothing, um, I can't really describe it. It's like something you have to see in person. Um, these, on, these, on this wall, these are two pieces um, that depict two different um, Dia de los Muertos uh, celebrations. This one is like Leo Fes Ramirez Celestino. And it is a painting on amata paper, which is a bark paper um, that's been used in Mexico since pre-Columbian times. It's um, 
it comes from the oh, the Nawa word a model for paper. And it depicts here's all the little skeletons taking their offerings back to the land of the dead. Here's everyone leaving all the offerings at the grave sites. It's a really intricate, um, detailed, detailed painting. And uh, I believe some of it was painted with um, cactus needles. So Amata paper, uh, what's interesting about it is it was banned once the Spaniards came and ceased everywhere except for um, Otomi communities, which are in the states of Puebla and Veracruz. And it was only used for um, ceremonial purposes, but now it's starting, it's like mass produced and artists are using it more. Um, yeah, and then this other piece here is by Teofila Servin Barriga. It's a nighttime piece of uh, another Dia los Muertos celebration. It's embroidered, um, thread embroidered on hand woven cloths. And you can see all the fine detail that they put in it. Um, this artist is also from Pascuaro, Mexico. And this is a depiction of Dia los Muertos in Pascuaro. And it's a very beautiful piece. And we'll move along over here and we'll start with the community altars. This first one is um, for artist Rina Lasso. She was a Guatemalan Mexican artist. And um, we have a video playing of her um, explaining her mural here. She was known for painting um, a lot of um, Mayan, um, a lot of Mayan, um, what am I trying to say, creation stories and uh, Mayan history, things like that. In this painting, uh, it's called the Mural of Maya Life. This was actually her last mural right before she passed away. Um, we will be acquiring this mural in Me at Mexicarte in a few years um, from Mexico City. How long does it take? I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Sorry, we got a, a question about back on the other one with the cactus needle in the picture. I'm sure it took a really long time here. Okay. Yeah, that's a really tedious um, endeavor. And it took months uh, for us to get that stitched painting because we actually commissioned that work. Um, back at Arena Lazos, she took years to create this painting. And here's some examples of um, pre-Columbian artifacts. This is um, her altar or ofrenda. So like I said, she was a, a muralist, a painter. We have her paint here. And ofrenda will have personal belongings of the individual you're creating it for, has brushes, photos. A really cool fact about Rina Lasso also is that she um, studied under the artist Diego Rivera. He's a very famous Mexican muralist um, who was married to Frida Kahlo. So as we walk through the um, community altars, I'll start talking about how um, every altar, it's very personal to whoever's creating it, but they all have um, similar elements. So in a traditional ofrenda, like if we look at this one right here, which is the altar de muertos by um, the Consulate General of Mexico in Austin, you'll see um, up close, Let's get closer. We'll have um, traditional things like sugar skull, but we have, like I said, elements. So the elements are earth, air, fire, and water. Earth will be symbolized by food, corn. We have rice grains here. Um, 
Fan de Muerto is very typical and that represents um, Earth. We'll have, um, yeah, there's Fan de Muerto. We'll have salt because salt was believed to um, purify the spirits as they return from their long journey um, from the land of the dead. Grains for food. Um, we also have um, air, which is symbolized by papas de gado, because it flows in the wind. We have um, fire, which is candlelight. We have candles here, we have some on the floor. We can't light real candles in the gallery, <laughs> but we have them here. Um, and then water, which will, which will be symbolized by any sort of drink or beverage that's on the ofrenda. There we go, yeah. Why? Oh, because uh, there's two different kinds of beans here because I think that people here traditionally eat pinto beans and black beans. So I think we're trying to cover everything. <laughs> um, so then also marigold flowers, like I said, are the traditional flower of um, Dia los Muertos and you'll see them on every altar. Um, marigolds or Sempasuchil are believed to um, because they have a really strong scent, they're really fragrant flowers, and then they're really bright colored. They're believed to help guide the spirits back. So you'll see people crumble petals in a pathway, and you see them everywhere, and the smell, the scent is supposed to um, help draw um, your loved ones back to the altar. Oh, also, on that same note, copal or incense, we light that on an altar because it's fragrant and it also helps, the smell also helps guide the spirit. So we'll keep going through. This one was um, created by Maria Eugenia Ramirez Flores and it's in memory of the Mexican victims of the COVID-19 pandemic um, here in Austin. There's some photos. Like I said, every ofrenda has um, a photo of the person who passed away. And sometimes ofrendas are made, you'll make one ofrenda for multiple people like the one we just saw with that the Mexican um, consulado created or this one for the victims of COVID-19. And you'll see all the traditional elements, papel picado and everything. Over here, really quick, this is a really cool altar we have um, by the Austin um, classical guitar team here in Austin, Texas. It's called Our Family. And if you check out our website, we have a link to this altar. What's interesting about it is all these musicians who work with um, Austin classical guitar got together and they each created a um, a composition or a short song and a video that went along um, with this altar. So you can click on the, there's like a hot spot button and you can click on each one and hear the song for each of these people. And it's a really beautiful project that they did. And there's our musicians on the altar. And like I said, it's a really beautiful altar. They put a lot of work into it, um, especially all the music that they made. It was a, you can tell it was a labor of love. Here's some calaveras. And then they put all the traditional elements, belongings of people, uh, guitars. I should pick this flower up. Put it back on. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to walk to the smaller gallery over here, the pink room. Oh, what was the question? Okay, so every altar will have um, different levels. It depends on 
how you want to make it. But traditionally, I think I believe each level of the altar represents. So the Aztecs believe that there was different levels of the afterlife. And so each level um, symbolizes that. So the, the journey back from the land of the dead is like a really long one because there's so many levels of the afterlife. And, uh, Another question. When do people start preparing to make altars? Oh, um, I feel like months like at the beginning of um, October, like, well, here with Mexicarte, I feel like some people were preparing for a long, <laughs> a long time before. When did we have the open call? Uh, probably September? August, September. Yeah. So some people prepare like, you know, the month in advance, probably. One more question. Mm -hmm. What would they do if they knew someone was going to die but had not died yet? Oh, that's a good question. I think that's more depending on the person. Like, would you count them on the altar already? I, I would probably wait till the following year. <laughs> I wouldn't want to make them feel bad. <laughs> so this one's called Una um, Vida Unida. It's by Alex Casas and Ali Garcia. Um, they work for, um, they have a business called Palehurst, and it is a, um, how would you describe it? Death care business. They, they're Latina death care workers. And they, their belief is that um, they want to ensure all families are supported through the most difficult times of their lives and through years to come after that. So they try to help families um, the struggle uh, they're struggling with you know death they're um, grieving and try to make the process easier for them um, I believe that Dia los Muertos is a good like it's a really positive thing it's a, a good way to to cope because like Dr. Vargas said people generally see death as, it's a very sad difficult thing but because uh, Mexican culture doesn't really fear death. They sort of embrace it. It's easier for them to, you know, get together and sort of mourn this person together and, and you celebrate this person's life and you remember them and you tell stories about them. You remember all the things they love and it's easier to kind of cope together, I believe. Let's look at this one over here. This is one of my favorite ones in the um, gallery because it was created by a kindergarten class at the Aldea Verde School. And I'm an art teacher, so anything kids make, I love. <laughs> so this one's uh, for um, Maestro Francisco Toledo, who is an artist. There's some photos of him. And the students at the school recreated a lot of Francisco Toledo's work in their own style. And um, all the elements that they added, a lot of it was handmade by them, like the paper flowers were created by the kids. Um, here's some example. So this is Francisco Tolado's work. And then here's the student's reproduction. Francisco Tolado was known for making these kites. And there's the kids example. There's one with like a monkey. <laughs> The kids also made, um, let's see. Yeah, we're looking at all the different kites and the children's versions. Um, the children also made this structure of skulls. Uh, these are um, plaster, but the whole structure is supposed to be uh, the student's depiction of a sompantli. And a sompantli was the structure that the Aztecs created where they would stack skulls, kind of like um, if you all ever seen a county a counter like an abacus, <laughs> that's kind of what it looked like, but it had skulls on it. And they believe that as the skulls um, would disintegrate outside and fall and like the teeth would fall out, it they would go back into the earth and they believe they were like seeds. And as they would um, go into the ground, new life would come out. So it was a cycle of life. And you already showed them the, on the ground, this is a Katrina made out of sawdust. 
she's a little beat up now because we had a lot of visitors <laughs> over the weekend, sadly. But um, yeah, the students put all this together. They did a great job. Here's some more. This is by Eric Castileja. He made this for his um, grandparents. It's called Andale Siéntate Con Nosotros, which means come on and sit with us. Uh, his grandparents were known for being real warm and welcoming and inviting people to just come take a seat with them on their porch. So he kind of reproduced that feel. He put chairs um, that belonged to his grandparents. And um, so actually Eric is one of the people who made uh, an ofrenda that really kept coming like almost every week and adding more and more and more. And even today I see new things that I didn't <laughs> notice even yesterday. So like um, they added pan de muerto and things like that. Uh, here's some pan de muerto in the shape of a person. So it's either shaped like this right here, like a round bun, or it can be shaped like a, a little person. And then there's his abuelita, Celia Granado's favorite thing. There she is on the phone. They put um, telephone, because I'm assuming she loved talking on the phone, sewing. Um, she liked those strawberry cookies. So you like to, when you're making ofrenda, you like to put all the favorite things of the person who passed away. Here's abuelos, um, Mateo Granado's side with his truck and his uh, bicycle and his, his, um, there he is right there. He likes to fish. He likes these orange candies. And there's pets. So a lot of people also will make ofrendas for their pets. Um, my own son made one for his fish <laughs> that passed away. Um, so it's really just to remember any anyone's special to you the holiday so yeah he he filled his up with a lot of friends and family members let's keep going oh this is the paleta man that was uh it's created out of paper mache this is by Angel Ortega from Garzig Design. Um, she created this for um, Adeladio Bernabe Urias. And if he was, here, he's right here. He was a paletero, which is like an ice cream man, someone that hands out popsicles. Um, and he was murdered here in Austin, Texas. And it was like a really big story. And so she made this in honor of him. Uh, but she also lost her uncle right here, Tio Lolo, um, to COVID-19. So she added his photo and made a little guitar here for him. And then she she lost her pet too. So she added her, her um, puppy here in paper mache and a photo of him at the bottom. Everything here is made out of paper, including the pan, um, pan de muerto, which I think she did a really fantastic job at. It's it's a really cool, um, non-traditional kind of ofrenda. <laughs> All right, let's take questions. Oh, wait, let's take questions now. Yeah, we're at the Do you mark. eat sugar scones? Is it like candy? So our question is if we eat sugar skulls. Um, I would say, truthfully, no, you can eat them, but <laughs> they're they're made for ofrendas or to give as gifts to each other. Um, you can try it out. It's just pure sugar. <laughs> so you'll get a sugar rush. Uh, they are made out of other um, things like uh, there's chocolate sugar skulls, which I've personally never tasted. Um, but they are edible. Are pyramids the same as ofrendas? Uh, no, they're not. Here we go. Um, the, the, the pyramids are dedicated in, in both Egypt and in Mexico to the worship of the sun. However, having said that, in Teotihuacan, uh, a very important ceremonial uh, site or city, the city of the dead, 
uh, which is north of, as I said, Mexico City, there are a number of structures, pyramids and other buildings dedicated to this idea of, of the dead. But we really don't know that much about that, I, uh, that particular uh, uh, city because it's really a city of mystery. Uh, however, getting back to your question, uh, pyramids are not uh, related to Day of the Dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can you a repeat of, on the answer to the sugar skulls? A repeat on the yeah. answer to the sugar skulls? So, <laughs> technically, you can eat them, yes. Maybe not. But I would. They don't taste particularly good to me. <laughs> but there, there are candies now that uh, are facsimiles of the sugar stuff. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I would say it depends on what, where they're from, you know, everything like that. Someone wants to see the fish one. I think I mentioned. Oh, okay. Did they mean that one? I think so. They were like, where's the fish one? But this is where all we have about Or maybe I thought maybe they meant this one here. Uh, one more question. Why only orange and yellow can pass two flowers? Oh, because that's the, the color that they they grow. They're naturally yellow and like a golden color. I mean, you can put paper flowers of all colors. Um, but when we're trying to depict Sempasuchil or marigold, that's the color that they grow. All right, it seems like that's all the time we have. Oh yeah, we're all for today. We're hitting our hard stop. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank you very much, you guys, for being in the house in Texas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.